afternoon, Wilkinson here. Today, I am with two lovebirds, Ken Avedisian and Jesse Rosenberg. Now, the question is, can you find true love in Palm Springs after age 60? And what's the answer, guys? Say hello and tell us the answer. Hi, this is Ken, and yes, you can find love in Palm Springs, even at your mid-60s. I'm Jesse, and resounding yes, at least for us. It was magical, and we did find love, and we continue to be in love. And you just got back from your honeymoon. We did. We, because of COVID, weren't able to travel to have a honeymoon after we got married in um, 2020. And so we took a month and went to Africa together and just had a fantastic honeymoon experience. Well, okay, we'll hear about that, but talk about your wedding first. Wedding. How'd that go during COVID? Well, during COVID. So we met. Oh, yeah. yeah. Let's start. Go right. back up. Okay. How'd you meet? So um, <laughs> we were both in Palm Springs over Leather Pride in 2018. And it was opening night and we get, you get your little bag and, you know, buy your bracelet and all that. And I had dropped the stuff off in the car and was walking back to Hunter's to visit some friends. And this guy walks up on the street corner and looks at me and he goes, hi. And I said, hi. And he goes, I want to kiss you. And I thought, who the hell are you? And I was a little bit taken back. And then I was thinking, oh, it's opening night of Leather Pride. Sure, why not? And we kissed <laughs> for, oh, about 15 minutes. Oh. Yeah. And then I, he said, well, what are you doing? I said, I'm going back to Hunter's to see some friends. He goes, okay, well, I'll join you. Well, it was a block away, and it took us another 15 minutes because we kept stopping and kissing. Whoa. Jesse, let's hear your side of that. Add something. <laughs> That's pretty much how it went down. Okay, well, uh, why'd you but, walk up to him? Right, so okay. I, I was going back to my car, because actually I was going to meet a friend. I just saw those beautiful lips, but mostly I saw those eyes and that smile. And I said, God, I want to kiss that smile. And so I figured, hey, I'm pretty out there. Why not just say what's on your mind? Are you normally that bold? Um, I, I am assertive, but I, I, um, I have chutzpah, as they say. Yes, he is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And then we went back to Hunter's and the rest is history. Well, that's, we need more than that. Okay. So, okay. uh, we actually spent, you know, in those types of weekend events, you usually don't spend a weekend together unless you're a lesbian. And uh -oh. uh, I better maybe, maybe want to cut that out, but uh, whatever. Um, All these comments are not the opinion of the host. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But he supports it. But it's probably true. Right. All right, go ahead. So, but we spent the weekend together. And at the end, Ken was going back to Seattle. I was going back to Boston. And we both felt something. And we stayed in touch. Did you each live there at that point? No, neither of us lived here. And although Ken was already thinking about moving here from Seattle, he lived in Seattle, had been living there for 40 something years. And I had mostly been on the East Coast and I was living in Boston. Ken uh, had a business trip in Cleveland and said, hey, I'm gonna be two thirds of the way to Boston. Can I come and see you? And I said, that'd be great. So we got together for a weekend and then we got together again. He came out for a visit. And then I think by the third time he stayed for a month and it was pretty clear that something was happening there. Well, I went out and I booked three return tickets, one a week later, one three weeks later, and one a month later, and ended up staying a month. I went back home for a week to Seattle and then went back again to Boston. And so there was definitely something going on there. And then at one point we were walking, it was winter, it was January, and it was freezing cold, and we're walking through this wooded area outside of Boston and he's crumping through the woods and he says, you know, I think maybe we should live together. <laughs> when and this I was, was just... uh, how long into it? A couple months? A few months. Yeah, okay. probably three or four months into it. Okay. So I was like, yes, I, I would like that. So I went back home, put the house on the market. So since I'm from Seattle, where did you, where did you live in Seattle? West Seattle. Okay. You know, the bridge is out, right? It's, it's opening back up again this, um, in a couple of weeks. Oh, it is? Yeah. Yeah, we actually visited there and we wanted to go back and see his house and we couldn't get back to Seattle. So we went all the way to where? Like an hour. Yeah, we yeah, went. Yeah, you go down south. Yeah. yeah, like to get, it was crazy. And then jog the down, jog and, over, back up. Can you imagine living there while that's going on? No. I'm Yikes. so glad. I can't imagine living there having lived here for three years. It's right. so wonderful to live here and 
Seattle's nice. Boston's right. nice, but no. So then what's the next thing? He put his on the market. And I put, so or I. Did you say, let's go to Palm Springs? No. Or so you well, didn't know where you were going when you put it on the market. Oh, I, we were going to Boston. Oh, you were going to go to Boston. Well, I'd sold, I, except for investments, I'd sold everything, but I had bought two units in an old building in the jewelry section of Providence. I was Mr. Providence Eagle that week, that, that year. And so in the middle of construction, and for various reasons, um, I ended up selling that. Only thing we did in that beautiful thing that got built out was to pee and have sex. So we we sold that, sold his place, and then came here. Why, well, why, why Palm Springs? Ken wanted to come here even before we met, and I was purely on a lark. I, you know, I thought, th- we met there, there's something romantic about it. it, let's try it, what the hell? I wanted to be somewhere else, just because I felt like, you know, it's time to do something else, shake right. up my life. And what, what year was this when you I, moved here? 2019, so it was a okay. year, almost a year, um, it was 11 months after we met that we closed on the house we now live in. The one you're in right now, and then you got married the next the year? The following year. We lived together in that house for a little over a year. Who proposed? Ken wanted to get married. I'd been married to a woman, and I have a daughter who's 27. Ken wanted to get married, and I really didn't feel like I needed to get married again. And then the more we talked about it, I realized it was important to him, and then it became important to me. And so actually, on the anniversary of the day we met two years later, I took him early in the morning. He doesn't let me drive because he thinks I'm a horrible Boston driver. So well, you t- probably are, but. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay. uh, right. So I, I drove him to the exact spot that where we met in that street corner to get out of the car. And he was like, what's going on? And I got down on my knee and proposed to him right there. Wow. At that same street corner. And that was it. And then his mother was coming for Thanksgiving. And that was a few weeks before that. And we said, well, let's get married while you and your mom can walk us from the carport. <laughs> to the." <laughs> so we made a huppah. We turned our, our sling into a huppah, and, uh, which was fun. <laughs> and we got married under a huppah. Cool. And Man. to this day, every time we drive by the corner that we met, we pull over and we kiss. And we tell each other how much Aww. we love each other. I know, silly, <laughs> but it's really very, very special. That's cool. And one other thing. So we we both have matching chains and the same locks. The locks have no keys. And we decided we wanted to mark our union, our relationship, with something that was really meaningful to us. So chains and locks have a lot of meaning on lots of different levels. They can be you've locked your heart as a youngster in love for the first time. And it's also there's a a whole thing in gay life about locks and chains and and collars and so forth. So, So you said there's no key to those? We, when we bought them, uh, we, we, we were told by the seller that the, they're the exact same Eagle lock, but there are no keys to either of the locks. So they're, they can, they, so they were open when you bought, no, them. they were closed and we just put them through the chain around the chains, but they, so okay. they, they can't, they cannot be open. So symbolically that's okay. also important. The chain can come off. The chain on, can come right. off. There's a, ca- I super glued his shut. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> he thinks so. Right. So that's your ring then. That's basically. our. Yeah. Uh huh. So and we ex- presented them to each, to each other when we got married. We took them off a couple of weeks before we got married, and then during the ceremony, we presented them to each other and put them on each other. Cool. What'd your mother think of that? She was in heaven. She was so happy to be there, and she was really happy for both of us, and still is. That's cool. What's a little bit of your background? Ken, when did you come out? When did I come out? I kind of came out when I was in college, kind of started exploring what that was like. And, you know, I dated women several times during those young years. And just, it just never, it never struck. It just didn't really hit right for me. I dated a couple men early on, and I actually was in a long-term relationship for about 22 years with Whoa. someone who now moved to Palm Springs as well, who's, um, he's a wonderful guy and we've kept a really good, good relationship. He has two daughters and one of the daughters has two boys. So I helped raise them for many years and then both of the daughters lived with us at different times. And so we still have this real great sense of family that we work really hard on maintaining. So you were a stepdad and Jesse, you're a dad. Yes. So what is your story? You're a late bloomer, obviously. <laughs> Um, as I, as I am, or was. Maybe. 
Uh, well. So <laughs> I left home when I was 16 to live with a Jesuit priest. And so... <laughs> Um, I, was, I wish that my puzzled look could be translated into the audio. Who <laughs> was a guidance counselor at my high school mm. who changed my life. I was, you know, a kid who grew up in a suburb outside of Boston with all of the trappings of a good life, but really felt very empty in many ways. And I think in my junior year of high school was really depressed or sad. I don't know if clinically depressed, but um, I did see a therapist. And this guy really showed me how love can exist. And it's a longer story. So I knew that I had interest in men and in women from a very early age. So he was, how old are you? 16. I mean, was there, are we talking abuse here or what? Or are we just talking like He's my mentor. I mean, what are you talking about here? Definitely not abuse. No, no. There, was, there was love. It was consensual, although I was well, I was a minor. And he lived two blocks from my parents' house. My parents were so absent, they didn't even know most of the time that I was gone. And I really didn't sleep in my bedroom for eight months. Wow. And it was transformative in so many ways. So you had that relationship, but then you went on to marry a woman. I had a lot of different relationships of different sorts between the time I was 16 and when I married uh, my wife at 35 oh. we, like lots of people there's a lot of time and a lot of tread wear and a lot of history and a lot of right. activity in lots of different places and then we before we got married actually we got pregnant and so we had a daughter and I think had we spent more time together we probably would have realized that we really weren't a great match but we had a kid and we were both very devoted to the idea of having a kid. So we stayed together for 23 years. Whoa. 22 years. Is she still in your life now or are you not on good terms? We're on good terms. We don't see each other very often. She still lives in Boston. I make a point of trying to get together with her every time I go to Boston. Our daughter lives in Oakland, California. So Do you near, see her? Yeah. I mean, it, she's it, in it, Oakland. Yeah, but, she's in Oakland. So right. yeah, I, yeah, a few times a year. Okay, cool. Does she have kids? No, she's out. She right now doesn't have a relationship, but she's fluid, but mostly interested in women. Oh, wow. All right. So let's swing over to your honeymoon. That's a good trip. <laughs> <laughs> so you just got back. Yes. Where'd you go? We started out flying from San Francisco to Doha, and we spent two nights in, three nights in Doha just exploring the city doing some museums and seeing some of the landscape there okay, and where is doha it's in qatar and so as um, many of us are geographically challenged you realize this right? yeah it's like a 16-hour flight so we decided just okay. to stay over there for a couple nights to get acclimated and then we flew from doha down to livingston at victoria falls and so we spent several nights in, at Victoria Falls in Livingston, right on the Zambezi River. That was, it was just magical. It was wonderful. There was a lot of wildlife there and just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful country. From there, we flew down to Botswana and we spent three nights in three different camps in different areas of Botswana with all very different ecological and animals in each of the areas. And just were in awe at the beauty and the, 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 the animals and the expertise of the guides and the friendliness of everybody in each of the places we stayed was amazing. We stayed in small places, so everything we did was kind of bespoke in terms of when we wanted to go out, how long we wanted to go out after dinner, if we wanted to go back out and do a night drive, we could do that. It was really a wonderful experience. From Botswana, um, we flew to Cape Town, South Africa, and we spent four nights in Cape Town just exploring the city, and it's a beautiful, beautiful place filled with art and music and food and museums. It's really a vibrant, vibrant city, very safe in all regards that we found. And then we spent a couple nights in Franchuk out in the wine region in South Africa. And then we flew from Cape Town to Dubai and spent two nights in Dubai to the Burj Khalifa at 142 stories high and ate and had a great time and then flew home on Emirates and just had a wonderful, wonderful experience. And the whole trip was how long? It's almost a month. How'd you come up with that trip? Who chose that? We both did actually. We both had talked about Africa as a place we'd like to go. And then we found this tour company uh, in London. We spent about a month back and forth talking about what we wanted 
to see what kind of experience we wanted to have, what time of year has different animals in some of the Okavanga Delta when the, the, the watering holes dry up and the animals come in and what kind of sightings we wanted to see and what kind of experience did we want in each place. If you, did you want to go to a place with 16 camps where you're in a, a Jeep with eight people out doing stuff or did you want it more one-on-one? And we decided we wanted the more one-on-one type thing. So we yeah. were going out most of the times with our guide and just us. And just to clarify, you're on a looky looky loo trip, not a hunting trip. Yes, definitely looky yeah. loo, <laughs> lots of pictures. Right. Jesse, what was your favorite part of the trip? can't think of a single event that was my favorite part, but I would say one, just the understanding of kind of, we talked a little bit before we started, how many of us humans think we're like the center of the universe and the animal kingdom exists without us. And it's actually our interruption that disrupts their rhythms. And it was just that sense of, oh, we are really disruptors and not in a good way. Um, And then the second was just how much of nature we are removed from in our daily lives uh, and how inadequate we are in surviving in nature. We learned in the short two weeks we were there how to identify a variety of different animal tracks, what different indentations in the soil meant, what kind of animal may have been there and for what reason the mating habits, the breeding habits of all of these animals and why they can coexist and why they can't, why lions are so important and why kills by lions are so important to kind of the the cycle of life in the bush. All of that was fascinating. That, and then the second was just the generosity of spirit of the people we met. It was just so touching. You're with guides who are very adept at what they do for hours at a time, just sitting in a Jeep watching a scene and you start talking to them about their lives and and so we got to... And they spoke English? They all spoke... Uh, there are many, many local languages. Tswana is the national local language, but since they were colonized by the British, uh, English is taught at school, so everyone speaks very good English. Cool. So in all the places, we had no problem communicating. How did you get along on the trip? Fantastically. Did you have a fight? No. We had a little bit of tension before we left. I think it was just because there was so much to do, and we have different packing styles, and it turned out that okay who's the neat one and who's the slob i want to know <laughs> or is that not the issue no that wasn't the issue i think we just chose clothing differently and okay. one of us chose clothing that was appropriate and another one chose was cold the whole time it was cold now i well, wouldn't have expected that well the nights it's the desert so it's like here the nights were right. in the 40s and the days were in the 80s so and you don't have heat in the tent so even though the tents are glamping amazingly luxurious tents there's no heat or air conditioning so you you you, know, you have copper you know, like bathtubs and things like that. But, you know, and they put what they call bush babies. They put these hot water bottles that are like with fake fur lined, you know, in, in the bed. So oh the bed gosh. is warm. It's unbelievable. <laughs> the, the level of service was just wow. ridiculous. Um, and these aren't tents like you and, and I think about camping. These are like, you know, Abercrombie and Fish meets, you know, Neiman Marcus kind of Whoa. thing. I mean, these are like extravagant, you know, things that are so well appointed that we didn't want to leave any of the places. We, they were just gorgeous. You know, they were huge and beautiful and with private huh. pools and, you know, the whole thing. So which one of you didn't have a sweater? Oh, well, I, did, I just layers, 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 layers. <laughs> And you didn't have the layers? I had layers. That's what. I, that's all I had, though, was layers. Oh, so and you a, kept putting on And your... a jacket, yeah. So I'd wear, like, put five layers on, and and it would warm up sometimes to the mid-60s to 70, and I would just start peeling stuff oh. off. And then as soon as the sun went down, I'd start putting it all back on again because it, when it gets dark, like here, it's, it's cold. But there, it's colder than it is here. There, this time of year, it's winter. And so it's a very different climate, and we just sort of underestimated that that climate so you got home we're back to life in palm springs which is wonderful it's great to be home after being away for a long time even with such a fantastic trip in our did you have a house sitter we did a friend of ours who's um actually just got a job in palm springs so we'll be at least be here for the he's in academics so we'll be here for the academic year he's a, from denver and so it worked out perfectly that he could stay in the house he's very responsible he was it was wonderful to know that someone we trusted was there you know looking after the house and enjoying it so it was good do you have pets? I can't remember. Just him. That's it? <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, so for those listening, in fact, probably some people will listen that already know this, but I'm calling you Jesse, but that's not your given name, right? It's not my legal name, right. Oh, tell that story with your... 
So my legal name is Jeffrey. And when I turned 50, my mother had a dinner party. She was kind of one drink, one drunk. She didn't even have a drink probably that night. But so <laughs> she started calling me Jesse. Uh, and <laughs> she my, called her son Jeffrey Jesse. Right. Okay. And uh, my daughter heard that. She was, I don't know, at that time, 12 or 13. And all of the cousins, you know, more or less her age, all overheard that. And they, they thought it was hysterical and they started calling me Jesse. And so it just the names kind of stuck and I, my mother passed and it's sort of a way of memorializing her right. and remembering her kind of goofiness. So the people in your life in this chapter in Palm Springs know you as Jesse. Many and of, the most people, of them. A lot, a lot on the East Coast know you as Jeffrey. Right. Yeah. Okay. The, one of the interesting things is my family, when they met him, he was Jesse. And yet on Facebook and other places, it was Jeffrey. And my mother was, she was like, oh, my God, I think I've been calling him the wrong name. What, how am I supposed, what name am I supposed to call him? <laughs> <laughs> Either one is fine. <laughs> are you both, are you working, retired or what? What are you guys doing now? We both work part time. I do work in kind of real estate finance. It's kind of project based. When there's something to do, I do it. We also recently together made an investment in a beverage company, an LA based beverage company, non alcoholic beverage company. And it's kind of a neat, they're really high quality uh, nutritional drinks. Their first product is a smoothie, coconut smoothie based drink. And now we're developing with them together a, a kind of energy brain boosting shot, two ounce shot, which has been really fun. So I have a background in nutrition and health and I'm a yoga teacher. So it's kind of bringing a lot of that background to bear in product development, which has been really fun. Cool. And Ken, what about you? I was in a finance guy for several years, a CFO of some smaller companies, but I really had a passion for food and wine. And I joined an organization, the American Institute of Wine and Food, several years ago that Julia Child and Robert Mondavi and Richard Graff founded. And I was a chapter chair in the Northwest and joined the national board of that organization. So I did a lot of food and wine educational classes and, and, and programs for school children. And so I always had a passion for that. And I knew I wanted to get into the wine business. Um, I was kind of not loving being in finance. And so I ended up working for a company that does wine auctions for a couple years and then left there and worked for them doing internet stuff. And then I bought a wine wholesale company in Seattle with uh, another person I know. And so for about eight years, owned a wine wholesale import distribution company in Seattle and, and Portland. Ended up closing that in 2014, going back to work in the wine auction side of things for a while. And just recently started a company called Cordon Selections, and I do private wine cellar management. So people who have wine, not sure what they have, what they, what they should be drinking. Many people have some in a storage facility and some in their house and some in their office, and they just need to coordinate it. I've got clients who are building homes in the Coachella Valley that have a cellar in Southern California and some in storage and they want to pull it all together and be able to know what they have and, and, and help buy and sell and fill their cellar. Or people, death, divorce, health issues, want to remodel their kitchen. A lot of reasons why people want to sell some wine too. So I help broker their wine and help them sell wine and buy new wine i've got like eight bottles of two buck chuck out there can you help me well fred franzia just died so you know they might <laughs> I, be worth a I lot don't, of money uh, i don't really have any but it's funny when you get that is when you're having a party and that comes in it's like I, wow I, several years ago <laughs> when i was working for the wine auction company our ceo at the time said we should try to auction off two buck chuck and i thought oh my god you've lost your mind so he had me go out and buy a bunch of like a mixed case of two buck chuck two bucks times 12 24 dollars right we put it up online and sold it for like 90 dollars i was embarrassed to have to go out and buy it to start with and then it was hilarious that it, it sold for 90 dollars back when you could buy it at Trader Joe's for two dollars everywhere. Well, it's three bucks now, right? The two it buck chuck is three bucks. Could be. Right? I don't I think. I, I can't. I can honestly I tell you that I when I go in there that I don't. I don't drink that wine. <laughs> you don't? No, I don't. And then I, as we're sitting here, I thought of another thing. Actually, how we met, which was you have a little group that you started. What's that group? So we started a monthly cigar social in Palm Springs. 
and had our, had our own brand that we had um, created in Nicaragua and brought over. And cigars. so, yeah, and cigars. And so we do this monthly cigar social and we had you come and be a photographer to do photos with Santa. And we had two kind of fun Santas, one that was in a red kind of kinky Santa, one that was black Santa, one with a pipe, one with a cigar, and people could come and donate ten dollars for photos that all went to charity how the photos come out oh they were fabulous yeah, love them. <laughs> they still talk about <laughs> it nothing it's like great. plugging myself right <laughs> yeah, absolutely go for it if you're still in town this winter we'll rehire you i could come back <laughs> okay. well my house is not selling so i probably who knows i could be here so there's guys listening to this that are 60 plus and they're discouraged and i think i will never be with anybody what would you say to them? I'd say be vulnerable. Open yourself up for the opportunity. It's not easy. It's not. It's so, you know, in today's world, particularly in today's world, I think of many people want immediate sexual gratification and that's it. To really take the blinders off and be open to the possibility and just go out there and be yourself and it'll, it, it happens. It's magic. Look for the magic and when it's there, realize it's there and take hold of it so that brought up another question in my head so were you looking for somebody ken when the strange guy came out and kissed you yes i was i was you definitely were open to the possibility i was definitely open to the possibility i was ready to leave seattle i had been there for many years and i just decided i needed to shake my life up i didn't know exactly what that meant at the time i knew that i was typically liked being with somebody versus not being with someone. Right. But I had decided I just needed to probably leave Seattle. And Jesse, what would you say to guys? I would say feel deeply what you want. Don't look for a relationship just to fill a sense of loneliness or being alone. Be comfortable being alone with yourself and then kind of feel what you're missing in, by not having a partner. And if you feel like you're missing a lot, then maybe um, you really are looking for one. And then, like Ken said, just be open to it. And without, you know, as we get older, we get more set in our ways. We have more routines. It's, it's hard in some ways to let someone into your, into our own routines, but you have to do that. You know, it's easier when we're younger, when we have less stuff and less less life under our belts i'd say just right. be open to it did you imagine that you might find a guy when you're up and kiss the strange guy you like i actually was not looking for a relationship i had okay. just ended <laughs> a tumultuous my the first relationship with a guy having left my wife who was a very interesting guy he was a professor in boston and he became very possessive and i was really interested in sowing my oats and i told him from the very beginning that if we are in any way together it wouldn't be monogamous but as time went by he wanted more and more of monogamy for me and that just wasn't on offer and he got violent and actually I had to leave in a hurry and get stuff out of his house and he actually took out a um, restraining, restraining order, order. yeah okay. and he took me to court the whole thing was bizarre he uh, was very theatrical he showed up like he put dirt on his face and came with ripped shorts he had his son and daughter there at court and he had written an affidavit about how I forced him into an, an S&M scene that was totally it happened and he loved it and he wanted more but he had to, you know and so he wrote this whole thing and the judge kind of threw it out and <laughs> then two weeks later I got a FedEx package from Judge Judy in Los Angeles asking if if the two of us were interested in adjudicating our case in front of her and she would pay everything you know whatever I'll pay everything oh my gosh and I did you know so I took a picture and texted to him and he instantly said I want to go and I said well I'm not going so goodbye <laughs> <laughs> So he wanted so to do it. He wanted to do it. He loved he all the that theatrics yeah. of it. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, so I wasn't looking for anything in particular, except I just wanted to kiss this guy with these beautiful lips and these gorgeous eyes. That was it. Oh. You talk about baggage when you're at this age. So you actually bought a house together. So that probably was helpful, right? Because neither you weren't moving into the other's house. So we decided you were starting that was a, from the ground up, right? Yeah, that was an intentional thing. We've actually had a really fun time because we kind of went through each other's art and things that we liked. Absolutely, we wanted, you know, one of us wanted to keep it the other, regardless of the other person's feeling about it and stuff that we compromised on. And we, we had a great overlap in, in kind of general kind of aesthetics. Well, your, your house is great. I've been there a couple of times. Well, it's actually changed a lot even since then. We bought 
some fantastic art in, in Africa to come oh, by and see it. Yeah. And um, we're having a local artist. There's one wall that we left. We were thinking we'd find a large piece in Africa. We didn't. But we found a local artist who we've recently commissioned to do a piece for us for that large wall. And we're excited about that. And so what, what's been really fun is, and we you've seen the house in its 2.0 version it was a we bought it 1.0 and then we totally gutted it and we designed it together how we we and actually we were just thinking today as we were we're going to a dinner tonight and we had to make some stuff how easy it is for the two of us to be cooking at the same time and doing stuff in the it's just it was a great kitchen yeah it's a, yeah, it's a <laughs> yeah it's a great kitchen it's a great house and how it's you really, both cook we both yeah i went to cooking school you in did. paris and, and ken's a great cook but i don't he does he does most of the cooking as it should be Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> Who takes the garbage out? I do. On, on I okay. do. I do that. I clean everything, and right. I'm not the clean one, or I'm wow. not the organized one. I'm like, oh my god, where did this come from? <laughs> All right. Any final thoughts? No, but thank you for taking the time to do this, and well, thanks for your podcasts. Fun. They're wonderful. You guys are great. Yeah. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.